Hi, my name is Joe Jackson. I'm an interviewer and a broadcaster. And what you're about to hear is one of the 1,400 interviews I did for publications such as the Irish Times, Sunday Independent, Hot Press Magazine, and for RTE Radio 1. How do I know that there are 1,400 interviews exactly? Because I recently digitised all the damn tapes myself. But please remember that many of the interviews were done for the print media and recorded on cassette tapes. So some are, let's say, sonically challenged. But sometimes sonic considerations should give way to historical significance, I believe. And I'm glad to say that at least some powers that be in RT Radio 1 agreed with me on this and broadcast between 2015 and 2018 many of my interviews in a series called The Joe Jackson Tapes Revisited. What follows is one such program edited for this podcast and minus music, which I can't use for copyright reasons. The full tapes can be accessed at joejacksoninterviewer.com. Either way, enjoy. Hi, welcome to the Joe Jackson Tapes Revisited. And if you heard my Leonard Cohen show in this series, you'll know that after interviewing Lenny in 1985, I decided to become an interviewer purely to meet more of my heroes. Eartha Kitt was nearly next in line. And even though she wasn't necessarily a hero of mine, I certainly remember a night when I was nine or so, saw her on TV singing Just an Old Fashioned Girl, draped across a chaise long, and she, let's say, moved me in a way that bewildered a little boy. Then later, like most teenage boys in the 60s, I lapped up Kit as Catwoman in Batman. Then later again, during the early 80s in fact, given my love of lounge music, I grew to love Kit's songs. Not just the so-called sexy recordings such as the subtly titled Do It Again, but more so songs like Le Dolce Vita, The Heel and Thursday's Child. But it wasn't until I read in preparation for this interview Eartha's 1956 autobiography, Thursday's Child, I realised there was far more to this fascinating woman than her one-dimensional public image suggested. That's why, when I read only days before this interview, a snide, if not sexist, article about Eartha, written by a woman, depicting her as little more than a gold-digging whore, I decided, by way of giving something back to Eartha Kitt, to at least try to offset that image. At the time, Eartha, born on a cotton plantation near North in Orangeburg County, South Carolina, was 60 years old. The interview, during which we were joined by her assistant Ted, took place in a room at Jury's Hotel in Dublin, only hours before she was due to appear on The Late Late Show with Gay Byrne. Before the interview began, I told Eartha Kitt that I intended to put at the start of my article a quote from her song Thursday's Child and to close it with a quote from her lyric for the song All By Myself. Sadly, Kit never recorded the latter, so let's kick off with this. So having opened with that lyric, uh, Thursday's Child, you also used that as the title for your first volume of autobiography. Has the lyric turned out to be true for you? Always has been. Thursday's Child has far to go. And things looking, the world could be a wonderful place, but not when you wear Thursday's face? Yes, still. It's difficult when you are a mulatto. It's more difficult to be cast than if you were completely black or completely white. You're in between. You don't belong to either group, and therefore you're constantly being, in some form or, the fa or fashion, prejudiced against Yeah. in our profession, particularly for television and movies. Would that have more to do with your colour rather than being Thursday's child? Or it has more to do with your colour. That's why I call it Thursday's child, because the colour prevents you from doing a lot of things that you would be doing with the kind of talent you have. Um, rather than what uh, you would be doing more readily if you were one colour or the other. Okay, no, I thought it applied to anybody who was born, born on Thursday. No, 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 it has nothing that, to that do fable. with... No, it has to do with the fact that you have a struggle in your existence. I just say Thursday's child because, as I felt then and I still do feel now, okay. Thursday's child, in the poem itself, Thursday's child has far to go, and that's the way I feel. And you don't feel you've travelled further or gotten nearer to whatever destination you I still have a far, a far away to go. Yeah. It's not a matter of feeling you've gotten nearer. You've made a step forward, maybe. But sometimes when you have made a step forward, somebody sets you back because, well, you, they say, well, you're not our type or whatever they may, they, they may want to call it. We did a film called Anna Lucasta with Sammy Davis Jr. 2,500 cinemas in the United States would not take the film because I don't look black enough on the screen. It looks like a white woman making love to a black man. So the film was not shown as readily as it should have been when shown. When was that? Was it? About 1957. And you keep saying that things are changed, but you find that it hasn't changed that much. 
Yeah. Because now, if it, if I was doing the same things today that I was doing then, then I could say uh, maybe we have progress. made tremendous progress. But I'm still coming up against that same kind of prejudice. One of Eartha Kitt's earliest memories is of being left in the woods with her sister Pearl while her mother, Anna Mae Keith, went to steal a watermelon and fruit. I asked Kit if such experiences fired in her a desire to rise above poverty. I don't think I ever thought about it. I want three square meals a day and warm clothing and a decent roof over my head. But as far as telling myself I'll never starve again, I don't think that was so emphatically um, in front of me all the time that I was determined to be successful. I was determined not to be a burden to anyone, that's true. So it was more that? It was more that, yes. Then aiming for riches? I'm still not aiming for riches, I'm aiming for comfort and peace of mind. Have you achieved either? Not peace of mind, according not to the so last much, question. Not so much peace of mind, no. Because comfort? I, Material comfort? Well, I'm comfortable with very little, so <laughs> yes, I can say I can say I have a decent roof over my head and warm clothing, and now I can afford three square meals a day. Do you still have but to beyond that, what else is there? Do you still have to come out and do stuff like this? Still work? If I sell my properties, I will not have to, but I don't want to sell all of my real estate. So you have to do this? You have to continue? Be and also because I want to. You want to? I like working. I could not sit home and go crazy and do nothing. And the only thing that I know is the theatre. By the way, the lyric I mentioned earlier for the song All By Myself was originally a poem Eartha Kitt wrote to her daughter one night after a terrorist bomb exploded in a hotel at which she herself was staying. Kitt was afraid there might be a second bomb and that she might never see her daughter again. So she wrote what's basically a goodbye note, summing up the life she led. Later the poem was set to music, but as I said earlier, it was never recorded. So at this point, I told Eartha Kitt that back in the days before home videos, I made an audio cassette of her singing all by myself on TV, but that the recording was not great and I couldn't make out all the lyrics. Yet the lyric I could make out of all by myself is say, living alone, I think of all the friends I've known, yet when I dial the phone, nobody's home. Mm -hmm. So does that not work against, uh, you said you never felt that a house, it's just a house without a man. Is there never a point where you, would, you do feel you would rather have a constant companion there all the time? Not constant, no. Not constant. No, because I've been alone too long in my life. And particularly since the, the day I can remember, my mother was being rejected because I'm a yellow gal. And as I said to you before, I'm not black enough to belong to this group and not white enough to belong to that group. And, and also being a bastard child and part Cherokee and part black and part white, he said, you're a bastard child. You're considered an ugly duckling. Nobody wants you. That element of being a bastard child, many of the most successful business people in the world have been fired by that. You know, again, a determination to go out and say, well, to hell with you, so I'm mm -hmm. going to prove something anyway, I'm going to prove myself, my worth to myself. You felt, has that been driving you forward too? It might be, but I don't think that consciously I have thought about it because I'm, I just feel I have to do the best job possible at any given moment that uh, I'm on, so to speak. But you are driven. I'm driven to work, yes. Yeah. That's why when you ask me, do I have to do this anymore, it's not a matter of me having to do it. It is, it's because I, not from a monetary point of view, but I feel emotionally and psychologically, yes, I have to, because the only family I know is the public, outside of my daughter, of course. I've never had a family unit, and therefore I think the love that the public has given me through all of these years have really helped me maintain survival. And as long as I feel the public is there, it makes me feel worthwhile. If Otherwise, if I was to be sitting home and not working, I don't know what I would do, really. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that your, your mother gave you and your sister away because this, this man she was courting couldn't accept you as a yellow gal. That's right. Rejection that young can lead to either kind of a, a pathological fear of rejection which is also, you're also reaching for, you have a great appetite for acceptance, or you can just say, to hell with them all, I don't need anybody. No, I could never say to hell with them all, because I have a great, insatiable appetite for acceptance. And that's why I, I feel very close uh, to the situation where people are constantly being oppressed and rejected, because I know the feeling probably better than anybody. Have you ever risen above a fear of rejection? No. Would you even fear rejection on a TV show like Tonight or, yes. or Truth? Something as... Yes, yes. 
And is that is that a realistic reaction to what's going on here, or is it all that? You know, all the stuff behind you. You know, I think it has to do with both. Yeah. Not only what, not so much of what is going on here, but what my experience has been. If yeah. your mother gives you away, you think everybody's going to give you away. So you walk in constant fear, particularly when I have to do a job and walk out on that stage or be presented to the public or I meet a new person. I'm somewhat afraid of you right now because I don't know how you are going to accept me yeah. or if you have even <laughs> accepted yeah, me. Yeah. And again, mm -hmm. are you accepting me as Eartha Kitt? You don't know what the private me is all about. And I think there is a constant feeling of saying yes, Eartha Kitt has been accepted, but what about Eartha May, that little urchin in the South who was put in, in a crocosat bag and beaten almost to a pulp? You don't know her. And I think very often that's what I'm fighting for you to see, even though I think that it would never be. No matter how many stories you read about me, you don't have the feeling of Eartha May. Okay. And that's the feeling I'm living with all the time. And it's wonderful to have Eartha May covered up by Eartha Kitt and being accepted. So now Eartha, Eartha Kitt can feed Eartha May. All right. Well, I'm trying to get a sense of Eartha May across to if you understand that, because I did read that in the book. Yeah. I got that from the book. So it is Eartha May I'm trying to get across to readers, if that's all right. OK? Yeah, Eartha Kitt is not so much afraid. She's just, it's Eartha May. It's, it's, who is deathly afraid of meeting new people. <laughs> okay, here, let me say something. I was not at that point, and nor have I ever been really a trained journalist. I'd learned it as I went along, and I was new to interviewing. So when Eartha Kitt broke down and cried, I was at a loss. And some would say that by relating to her my own experiences, I stepped over the line journalistically. Maybe, but I draw my own lines. I think a lot of us can relate to that, the fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. but. I, could, I can relate to it, but what I've been told is that fearing rejection, if I fear rejection from both of you, mm -hmm. that it's more, it may have more to do with the fact of my own family background, mm -hmm. rejection back there, mm -hmm. and this is not a realistic uh, reaction to this given situation. Why do they say that? Why do they? Mm -hmm. Because maybe the pain you felt then was so severe that it has just happened with you. Mm -hmm. It overtakes the present mm -hmm. and hauls your emotional self back to the past. Mm -hmm. But you're not, you're not really like, there's no way I'm going to reject you, or our readers are going to reject you. No, no real way, mm -hmm. right? There's certainly no way, because I am aiming for Eartha May, mm -hmm. right? So I can't do that, so for you to feel fearful of the fact that I might is not a realistic reaction to now. But, you know, you're, you're, you're reacting to the emotional thing. Yeah, but whatever I'm before. feeling right now is real, real to me. <laughs> no, but isn't it a pity we can't kind of haul in logic like that and say, OK, shape up to now uh -huh. and not to, to back then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And we fight it very hard. I mean, I can say we because I'm quite sure that, like you say, with the situation you've had with your family and the situation I've had with, with whatever circumstances I had been thrown into, you fight it very hard, mm -hmm. but when those points come up, you I can't. don't know. I don't think you can fight it 100% and so that you say, I don't give a damn, because there's no such thing as not giving a damn. You do, yeah. because you feel that your, your reason for your existence should be, um, I was going to use the word accepted, but I think the reason for your, your existence should be, it has to be earned, that's for sure. And therefore, I feel that I'm constantly trying to earn it. Yeah. It's, it's a shame that at times, you know, you can't say, I've won it. You know, I've won it, and I've won the right to be in this situation. I've won the right for these people to either say, I accept you or I don't, and my self-image doesn't depend on that. I might feel that when I'm on stage, yes. Yeah. And after the first song or two, then I, I start to feel it depends on how the audience is reacting to me, of course. That's natural. Yeah. When they give me the impression that says, Eartha, it's okay. You know. Eartha May, it's okay. Yeah, Eartha May. Because then Eartha, Kitt ta Eartha, Eartha May and Eartha Kitt then becomes a one person. All right. If I, I, if I can go back again to the private <laughs> again. No, as an actual fact, while I was preparing for this, there's an Irish writer called Edna O'Brien. I don't know if you've read her work. Mm. She really captures the essence of Irish womanhood, mm -hmm. Irish woman. And she was on radio last night, and she was talking about she felt that she continually writes about her childhood and goes back to her childhood and the influence her father had on her. But she said that if, as adults, we lose touch with our childhood, then we've lost something intrinsic and true and crucial. Mm, I you know, believe and, that. And I, I, think I really childhood. do believe that. So that's why I think most of the truths that shape us, and as you've just proven, that linger forever, mm -hmm. are, are rooted mm -hmm. uh, there. 
So if I, keep, if I go back there, it's, it's because that's what I feel. Here I want to insert a quote that came later in the interview from Eartha Kitt, but it relates more so to this stage of her childhood. Eartha Kitt believed that her mother was murdered. Yes, I, I only saw this in the recent interview. You were, you were around six or seven when your mother died. When you wrote in the autobiography, there was no mention of the suspicion of her being poisoned. Did it was taken that? out of the book. It was, or was it? Yes, it was edited. In those days, you couldn't say things as loudly as I can say them now. So, so this is an actual suspicion of yours or something that you can prove or you're trying to investigate or what do you know for sure? No, it's too late to investigate anything like that now. I heard it through the cracks of the walls of this little house we were living in when my mother, the night my mother died. I remember distinctly uh, after my mother, because of me, was rejected from door to door to door, begging for shelter and so forth. When they saw what color I was, they said, no, we don't want that yellow girl in my house. And in the middle of the night, when my mother was begging this man, whom she eventually married, to accept her two children, he said, no, I'll take Anna Pearl, but I will not take Eartha May. He already had about five or six children. And he said she would cause disturbance in my household. And shortly thereafter, my mother took me to this black family who used me as a work mule. But then it was those children, you th or the, the children there? Who you, the children who... of the family my mother gave me to. Those were the ones who were beating me all the time. And you suspect those of having poisoned her? No, 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 the oh, people sorry. she married. And since I didn't talk, and I was always afraid to be seen, I was always with the animals under the house. So when anyone came to the house and they would start talking, then of course I was a very good listener. And so I heard a lot of things that they didn't know I was listening to. And my mother had a, my second sister, Almeida, was born through this man. And I remember the night she died, the people in the house that my mother had given me to had gone over there. And some time later, they came back. And they started talking, whispering among themselves. And I heard the whispering. And I looked through the crack of the wall. And I saw them gathered around the fireplace, talking. They had found letters that were in the middle of my mother's mattress from one sister who was still in the South, who wrote a letter to the sister in the North, like Chicago, and accused my mother of being unfaithful and blah, 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 and she's taking over the household and we don't like it and so forth and so on. And a letter came back to her that said, uh, don't worry, when I come home, I will get rid of her in such a way she will never be able to bother us anymore. I heard all of that. And then as when my mother died, they took the mattress that she died on and threw it out of the window and they were burning it because they did not want to leave any evidence behind. The neighbors saw this fire in the yard and they went over to put the fire out and that's when they found these scorched letters that said what I'm telling you about now. So I, have, I cannot go to the law and say these people killed my mother but I know it up here because I heard it. And then too, my mother, sometimes she would come out of this, her unconsciousness, and then she would start talking. But people thought she were, was hallucinating, but she was telling them exactly what happened. The people were all in the field that day. And this sister who had come from Chicago made a meal and she sent my mother to the well to get water. And my mother said when she came back, there was some kind of seasoning that she was told to try by the sister. My mother ate the food. And shortly after that, she got very ill, like she was going to get sick on her stomach. And she ran to the door to vomit. But her husband was at the door. And she didn't want to be embarrassed, so she held it. <clears throat> which eventually killed her, and it took about... Oh, what? Uh, it took her about three or four or five months to die. So that's when she was in agony and she'd come out of it and in agony and she'd come out of it. And every time she came out of it, she would tell them what happened. And they were verifying this the night that she died. This is like a catalogue of, of, of sadnesses, isn't it? Yes, but look what happened to me. 
that's the, well, that's why I hope to come out with him. Yes. Yeah, I want to give people, <laughs> send people home smiling and inspired and hope. Yeah, after, I don't, after traveling through. Yeah. That, and you, you feel that there must have been a reason for the gods to have put you through this. And I think you'll be, we are being tested all the time to see how strong we are, what we are going to do with these uh, happenstances. And I think that fate throws me a card every day of my life, and she says, okay, Ruth, let's see how you're going to deal with this one. <laughs> yeah, because you don't say, look, hold it for a week. <laughs> Who needs them? <laughs> well, then you should be made of steel. Okay. Uh, you have a feeling that says, now, wait a minute, I have to go through this again? <laughs> I got my deck for this year. <laughs> now let's get back to the original sequence of questions. As a child, you were once tied to a peach tree and whipped by other kids as he called you. Once. Yeah. I was, as long as I was in that house. Day every continue. single day that I can remember. And I may be exaggerating, but the intensity, the, in, the intense of uh, those beatings went on as long as I was in that house. That's why I think my aunt eventually, through a letter, found out how I was being treated in this household. And then she brought me up north to New York because they told her that if, uh, if she didn't take me out of there, that I would either be mutilated, starved to death, or worked to death. Okay, so tenderness, tenderness obviously wasn't part of your childhood. No. Or you, you, you wrote of this, the craving for the tender touch, how you used to touch yourself, caress yourself between your breasts, mm -hmm. your, your tiny breasts, to mm -hmm. get a sense of being feminine. That's right. You, you were caught doing that and whipped severely yeah. for that. How did that affect your attitude to your own body and to sexual pleasure? I didn't want to touch it anymore. And I think also, even though it's another feeling that you're fighting all the time, you don't, you're not very much enamored of a man touching you either, because you think something is wrong. With you? Yeah. Because you were beaten for even touching yourself then? Yeah. And also you feel that the sex act is, you want it, but you don't want it. And you, you want the man to be very gentle to you. And you want to feel that you are, you are the sexual partner rather than a, a sexual thing. And I know I've had difficulty in that area. Maybe, I, maybe that's one of the reasons why I don't have a man in my life now. Because he has to be extremely gentle for me to allow myself to be accepted that way. You've always had the twin response, like when your, your description of with Alex, was it by the lakeside, when you were maybe only 15, there was a double feeling of uh, the urge rose in you like a bat out of hell, you mm -hmm. described it. Mm -hmm. A strange description when you think of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes. And it, right, it was, because that that's a dark metaphor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the second one was, and so did fear. That you had that's, the urge right. and you had the fear. The fear. But I, my, my reading from the book again, I may have misread, was that that was overcome when you then met Charlie. Was it when you were in a love relationship and that you were able, you were able to give vent to your sexual, your sexuality, mm -hmm. because, true, true love. Yeah, you thought it was true love, but then again, when you oh, I mean through, I didn't. Yeah, through, through love. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you were hoping that it's that the feeling has been erased. Yeah. Uh, and then you find that even though you have allowed yourself to be accepted in this way, hoping that it's true love and that this is a partnership that you want to go on with for the rest of your life, and then something happens and it's broken, then you start having that feeling again of fear. Of f sexual fear? Sexual fear and the rejection and the that comes of... into that. Yeah. So, so that wasn't erased in you. You didn't come to terms with your own sexuality and your own appetite. And I don't think so. No. Maybe that's why I am the way I am on the stage, where everybody thinks she's such a sex kitten and all of this sort of thing. You know, to me, it's it's laugh. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with it because maybe that's one of the ways I'm releasing myself from that fear. So you wouldn't say that sex has given you as much pleasure as your being sexual in song has given to the rest of the world. No. No. Does that not seem? Tragic, sad? Not really. It is sad, but at the same time, there have been one or two men in my life that really gave me tremendous sexual pleasure. But then they got up and walked away. So the fear comes back. Is there never an element of you pushing them because you don't want that closeness or you're afraid or whatever? Is there never also 
What do you mean by me pushing them? In, in relationships end, the, you can't, I think it's Dory Previn who said, uh, Andre Previn walked out the door, but Dory Previn said the person who leaves isn't always the one who goes out the door. Mm -hmm. That you can be living with a person and have mm -hmm. left them emotionally or yes. sexually or some other way. Yeah. So in that sense, you're pushing them. You know what I mean? Away it's, it's from a, you. Yeah, it's a double action. Yes, because it's also a feeling that uh, if you allow the situation to continue, one of those days, uh, one or the other is going to leave. And you are always constantly afraid that the man is going to be, the, your partner is the one that's going to leave. And therefore, if your mother gave you away, you expect everyone to give you away. And therefore, you have a tendency maybe to push them away before they actually give you away. But seeing that as you do see it now, can you not see it at the time and say, I'm not going to let this happen this time, I won't kick him out before he goes, or I won't keep pushing when him I so decide that he has to, not go. to When I decide for him not to go, then he decides to go. It's <laughs> <laughs> a fucking crazy chess game. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he decides the door. His mother pushes him out the door. Oh, mummy. Mummy's oh, mommy there. Mummy pushes him out of my door. There, Arthur Kidd was alluding to a comment she'd made earlier and that I cut from the show about how a mother had, she said, doomed one of her love affairs. Either way, at this point, I suggested to Arthur Kidd that to me, the sex appeal in her songs is heightened by an undercurrent of sadness, by a sense that the singer has felt so much pain that the only way out, however fleeting, is into sexual excess. I was tapping into a concept as articulated by Tennessee Williams, and I said that to Arthur, namely that we all live condemned to solitary confinement inside our own skins, and that the only time we escape from that sense of aloneness is through sex. This, this element, you know the way, like Tennessee Williams, you escape mm -hmm. pain even if only for moments through sex. No? I don't think that is in my case. But this element, no, this is what I'm saying, this can, this come across in the songs and, mm -hmm. and you've just said, I mean, th despite that coming across, that's mm -hmm. that's not there in Eartha May. I don't think but so. But it's, it's very prevalent in the, the persona of Eartha Kitt, as projected through the songs. Through the songs, yes. There's a world, a... Of, a world of absolute pleasure. But it's not just sexual pleasure, it's escape from pain. Mm -hmm. I, Which I, I, yes, I you know what I'm saying? Yes, I know. That it's not just uh, lightweight sexual en encounters. You're saying to somebody, we're lonely in this, you know, the solitary skin. Mm -hmm. Let's kind of get away from that for, for, for moments. Mm -hmm. So that gives another layer to your songs. Mm -hmm. And it also makes more tragic. What you you just seem to me. understand me very well. It was a good book. Listening to this tape again for the first time in 30 years, I understand why soon afterwards Niall Stokes, editor of Hot Press magazine, said that I brought psychology to the Hot Press interview, whatever that means. But I was and remain obsessed by the subject of psychology. Yet, if you don't share my preference for psychological biography, let me flesh out some of the facts from Eartha's bio. After moving to New York to live with her aunt, and where Eartha attended the High School of Performing Arts, she then moved to Paris, got a break as a chanteuse, and played Helen of Troy in Orson Welles' production of Dr. Faustus. Then, two years later, she was cast in New Faces of 1952. Okay, enough facts. Back to the chat. To go back to your childhood, you described the first day you sang a duet in church as the most joyous Easter Sunday of your life. Mm -hmm. Would you say it was then you decided to become a singer? No. No, no because Why? I didn't know what show business or anything like that was all about. And I never thought about exposing myself uh, publicly in that way because I'm a very, very shy person. Probably dangerously shy because it's very difficult for me to meet strangers, for instance. You could sit further back on this sofa. <laughs> I'll sit on this sofa. <laughs> no, I think that... Um, but you did say that day, the sense was, everybody has paid so much attention to me, I love it. Yes, it's true. So, so maybe subconsciously this might have been, but I don't ever remember... Saying. Saying or, or being aware of that consciously. Okay. But it was a way to get attention and to be recognized for your existence. You were there. Yeah, I'm there. And the same thing happened then when you went to the New York School of Performing Arts and you found the voice and you could command attention and had presence. Yes. The same sense again. Yes. So the blend of both, perhaps. It... Maybe, because um, I was scared to death of being rejected. And when I was accepted, the only girl or the only child out of something like 3,000 kids who were auditioning for that class, and there was only one dramatic class at that time in the New York School of Performing Arts, and I was the only one accepted. I felt Bliss. extremely, yes, yeah. extremely. And I think that we're all constantly looking for acceptance. Sometimes we go about it in the wrong way. 
but I've always wanted to earn my acceptance, not to just stand there and say, I'm here, so accept me. People like that can be terribly tedious. You know, there's people who assume that because they're actually standing there, the world should bow yes, down. Yes, and because you're beautiful and all that yeah. nonsense, and yeah. all the blah, 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 you're supposed to be automatically accepted. <laughs> At one point in Earth of Book, she reveals that Charlie, her lover, had all the time they were together been engaged to another woman. She wrote that after discovering this, she couldn't talk, stand next to him, or breathe the same air. I asked Kit, if love goes wrong, does it still engender that kind of response? By the way, Kit's reference here to both genders stems from the fact that minutes earlier she'd said that unlike some women who take female lovers after having suffered violence at the hands of a man, she herself was purely a man's woman. And, she said, besides, women can be just as violent. Can love, if it goes wrong, still affect you that way? Or have you left that behind? I don't think you leave anything like that behind. Because when a man has abused you in that way, or a woman, well, we're talking about both genders. But in my case, the man who was all engaged, and I said, huh, how could you insult me like this? That's what's going on in your head. It's an insult. It's treating you like a whore. But if not in that way, if love, go, if love goes wrong, is, is it that kind of uh, absolute kind of abhorrence for the person? Would you still rea react as strongly as not wanting to breathe the I same I think air? for the moment. Yeah. Yes, for no. the moment I think you do. Because it's sheer pain or, or that's total it's, pain. That's right. It's, it's total pain. It's agonizing. You want to drop the person out the top window of the eighth floor of well, the hotel? Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> sixth floor, sixth floor, fifth floor, what do we got? Four. a little hemlock in his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Eartha Kitt, they're actually paraphrasing part of the lyric for the heel. I then said to her that women who don't, as in her case, have a father figure in their lives, often seek out in love a father figure. Classic Freud, I know. But I asked her, had this been a pattern in her life? Was I'm attracted to older men, yes. Were you always? I think so, yes. It might be that I'm constantly looking for my father, whom I hope I'll never find. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> Everything has a double edge. <laughs> I'm constantly looking for her, but I hope I'll never find her. <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I mean, I, I think life is wonderful, but at the same time, there's always a joking side to it. Of course there is. And if I was to take everything so seriously, yeah. then I don't think uh, you would have an easy time, not that I'm looking for an easy time of survival, but then I think uh, things would be much more difficult because psychologically you have fallen into a trap yeah. that you may never be able to get out of. So you, you were attracted, we were talking about, you were attracted to older men. There was that yes. seeking, the, seeking yeah. the father. Because I think... The, it's a kind of security, of emotional security you're looking for in the man. And to me, an older man or somebody who is my age uh, has a better understanding of what I'm all about as an adult or as a 20-year-old or as a 30 or 40-year-old person because we have matured, you know, in that way. But somebody who is much younger than I am, I wouldn't say that I would not have an affair with a younger man. But I have my doubts about a desire to actually marry him. Because that's where I'm looking for a good partnership. I was saying earlier about people, again, who have kind of a shaky background. You very often find that people like that are better suited to affairs, to, to romances, to, to fleeting affairs rather than, rather than marriage. No, I'm looking for a permanent partner. It's not a <clears throat> matter of marrying for a permanent position but to have a partner whom I feel is going to be around at least for something that is called permanency. Still looking? Still part of the search? To tell you the truth, Joe, I don't know if I am or not, really. No. I think that subconsciously I feel that I would like to have a partner in my life. Yes, of course I would. Because I'm alone a lot, except when I'm going on tour and these guys are with me. But, I mean, they're not my lovers. Or they're not somebody that I would say, come to my room now, you know. But, but yes, you kind of, you want to feel that there's somebody there whom you can go knock on the door and say, I would like to talk to you. Or, um, I feel amorous right now. Let's see what we can do about it. But when you say you're not sure if you're still looking, is there also an element of maybe I'm complete unto myself or I'm quite happy with myself? 
you know that you shift in two two feelings again. It's always two sides to everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would want, sometimes I would need to be able to say I'm amorous or whatever. And a lot of the time, I just say I don't want to be near anybody. There are some times like that, yes, when I say I don't want to be with anybody. And you really go into yourself. But there is a middle of the night moment where loneliness grips you and it can be so severe that you really say, God damn, everything that led me to, to here, to be sitting on my own like this, isn't it? Yes, I thought that last night. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the curse I heard? <laughs> because no matter, no matter what, you know, it's like, um, well, okay, I have a jet lag and the clock in my head says I'm in America and my body is here. And you wake up in at 2 o'clock in the morning, you say, where the hell am I? Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Even though you want to be here, you still say, what am I doing here? <laughs> and you do get uh, a feeling of, I was telling Ted that this morning, that's a funny question that you're asking me, because it was just what I was discussing to him this morning. Right now, particularly after my daughter got married, you have that empty nest syndrome. I never heard of it before. Uh, no, yeah. when the everybody's gone, yeah. you know, so you feel there's there is no reason for your existence anymore because you're working for a family unit and you're working for a reason. Because I don't think that one works solely for oneself. Everything should be shared. And what am I working for now? Except to say, okay, Eartha, go out and see if you're going to be accepted or not. But she's not gone. I mean, she's gone out of the house, but you mean you still have, she's still your daughter. She's going to That's no excuse. You cannot use all of those cliches to me. All of my friends yeah. have been doing it since Kit got married. And I went through absolute hell because I was in my house all by myself, so to say. Well, she wasn't living exactly in the house for the last, uh, well, since she was about 18. It's something I had to accept because I knew one day the child is going to fly the nest, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's one thing. It's not like, well, let me tell you, how, how do I really feel about that? How did I really feel about that? I felt some stranger has walked into my life and has taken my child away, my best friend. What do I do now? And somewhat of that feeling is still within me. And I do wake up in the middle of the night and say, where's my child? As long as she's around someplace. Close. It doesn't have to be in the same house. But once that ring is put on the finger, then you start saying, well, I'm not needed anymore. Even if you know <clears throat> that's not true? Yep. And that empty nest syndrome that came over me and I told my girlfriends and they said, Eartha, we know somebody who went through that and they had to put them away. <laughs> well, you have some very good friends, don't you? <laughs> Where do you get them? <laughs> Jesus. Well, maybe, because... maybe you shouldn't lift the phone. The <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, a bit of insanity. Yeah. It was at this point I suddenly remembered that the interview was for Hot Press, a music magazine. So I asked her about music. Okay, with, from the beginning of your recording career, to, to, to give some of our music readers out there uh, something on music, you, you, you chose songs, uh, apart from the frothier kind of Eartha Kitt sex appeal songs, you chose very sharp acerbic love songs like The Heel that had really meaty, dramatic lyrics. Mm -hmm. What is it that attracts you to a, to a song? That song, <clears throat> particularly, uh, like, like we're talking about, the one who had me for his own, has flown the coop and now I'm alone, so, so those are not the exact words. But then here you again, you come to a feeling where it's rejection. But then he, after he gets through with all of his, whatever he's doing out there, he comes back to you and you feel being now you're being treated in an unkind way because he's taking advantage that he thinks you are always going to be there but he can go out and do anything he wants to. So that's where you got the idea for spicing up the tea or the coffee or that, wasn't that? <laughs> <laughs> see, so, but, but how, how in general do you, if you see a lyric, do, do you have to relate to it personally or do you have to say I understand what the writer or woman say or man you have to. I think in my case particularly you, re, you relate to it personally <coughs> because then you, be, you can become a better interpreter of those words. And I think any song should really tell a story. It's like writing a little scenario, you know, it's, it has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Uh, so, so that's how you choose the songs. There's kind of the twin element of the actress in you wanting to tell a story through mm -hmm. that play part mm -hmm. and also Eartha May, Eartha Kitt, yeah, being we're, able we're to... Both, 
yeah, to understand what the lyrics are all about, what is the storytelling, yeah. and do you feel it? Do you feel it? Yes. Do I feel it? You feel we couldn't feel it if you don't. That's right. We the listeners. You cannot be a good interpreter unless you are really involved. Okay. This is also one of the things that I think is not very good about our business today, because now the business has become so mechanical and so high tech that you can't even hear the words anymore. You don't even know what the hell these people are talking about. It's just a noisy music now. Yeah, maybe that's why people are constantly asking for this kind of, for the artists like myself. Where are you? Everywhere yeah. I go, they say, where are you? We want to hear you. But there are not that many places for us to work anymore because you don't have the uh, highly sophisticated nightclubs anymore, like we had with the Talk of the Town and the Café de, and the Café de Paris in London and the Persian Room in New York. No, they don't have them anymore. And these are very intimate places because I am a very intimate person. And just like I'm talking to you right now, I feel that you are listening to what I'm saying. If, and you're interested in, in my spirit behind what I'm saying too. But with high tech today, it's just a lot of noise. I don't, I don't see how you can possibly get into the person if, it's so noisy. Yeah. That's why I love the theater. Eartha Kitt and I then discussed what I at least perceived to be the kind of pressures that had been put on her professionally since 1952 to be sexy. Most exciting woman in the world. Are you tired of it now? No, I'm never tired of it. Okay. No. <laughs> all right, that's all right. Soon after that and long before Mr. Presley, you discovered the advantage of pelvic movements on stage, right? Remember you wrote about that in the book. But you know these endless cries of be sexy, Kitty, be mm -hmm. sexy. Has that not just put an unnecessary pressure on you to be just sexy? No, but, well, now, wait a minute. I never think of myself as being sexy. No, but I'm saying the pressure is then. That, then that would make it worse. The mm -hmm. fact that people were shouting that in 1950 or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And that people then expect you. Like I saw you on the Jonathan Ross show. and You're expected to come on with the growl and the purr and just present mm -hmm. this. Do you not feel you've been restricted by people, different just pressures on you to be just that and no more? Recording companies particularly. Because in the beginning, they only released those kind of songs. I think they did all the way down the line. I Want to Be Evil, Sissy yeah. Bon, you know, the Gimme Gimme songs. But two of the best albums I've ever made was with Tony Osborne, who has to do with songs like September Song. And, oh, yeah. You know, you just sing the songs. Yeah. But when the recording companies put you into a category, you're right, you're restricted, and it's very difficult to get out of that. And, and the public then... Their vision of you is shaped by that. Yes. Eartha Kitt and I would return to that subject when we discuss the newspaper article I mentioned at the start of this show. But first, I reminded her that she'd said in her book that when she was a teenager and saw Jose Ferrer in Cyrano de Bergerac, she, quote, loved the way he loved and the cries he cried. Eartha also identified at that point that she longed to bring a similar glow into people's lives. I asked her if, in the meantime, she'd lost that original impulse or not. No, I don't think I will ever lose that. You also said the need to belong you finally found only when taking love from an audience on stage. That's right. You still feel that way? Yep. Okay, so the, the question which arises out of what we were saying earlier is, how fulfilling ultimately can that love from an audience be when you yourself know that, that firstly, or many in the audience are coming to see Eartha Kitt mm -hmm. and not Eartha May? How, how right. can that satisfy you? Well, because half of me have succeeded, I'm still waiting for the other half to come up to par. <laughs> do, do, is it that you feel that they may come to see Eartha Kitt but leave knowing Something Eartha of Eartha May, yes. And that's why it's satisfying? It's very satisfying because somewhere along the line, through Eartha Kitt, Eartha May has been able to communicate and also say, there is a reason for my existence. Well, since there's not a chance for them to get to know Eartha May, I'm very satisfied with the fact that they at least are aware of Eartha Kitt. Aware of? Because the, between the two, on the stage, it becomes one person. Even though Eartha May is, she gets through, you know, somehow or the other she gets through. Yeah. That's why you were talking okay. about before, about uh, the kind of sadness and so forth that you hear in my songs and also in the voice. Yeah. So somehow or the other, there is some kind of communication with maybe a little bit of Eartha May has come through. You were talking earlier about record companies putting pressure on you mm -hmm. to do a kind of 
almost a vocal striptease on mm -hmm. vinyl That's right. for, for the satisfaction of mm -hmm. whatever people That's why I'm making those records for, um, for Jack Morali uh, also. So he was the one that said, you have to have a wow in every song that you sing. He wanted it to be a certain way because he feels that Eartha Kitt is that wow. Well, so it, it obviously makes you angry that or either that, that you have to provide that, or there is the emotional kind of spilling of your guts through the sad songs to win the attention. Does that not make you see, feel at times, why should I have, I as a woman, I as a person, mm -hmm. have to go through all this crap? Mm -hmm. to, Sometimes to... you do feel that, particularly with recording companies that say, like with Jack Morale, you're, you're, the real Eartha Kitt is the one with the growl. And you see, I am like this, and this is what he was telling me to do. I want you to sing everything up here, you know, like that. He thinks that's Eartha Kitt. And I do it as a joke. Which, sorry? Oh, it, when you do the growl and oh, all yeah, this sort of yeah, thing, you know. Yeah. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a great teaser. And I love taking the mickey out of myself. And I also love taking the mickey out of other people. I then read for Eartha this particular quote from the article in the Sunday Independent the previous week. The popular memory of Kit is one of the gold-digging vamp lying on the chaise long, dripping with jewellery, furs and the body furniture of paid-for sex. How did she respond? That's what's so funny to me because it, I take the mickey out of even that kind of subject. Yeah. And if I was really like that, you believe me, I'd be dripping in diamonds right now. But it wouldn't bother you that that is the po popular memory of? I don't really know if it bothers me or not because I don't think I really have thought about it that much. Yeah. Because I think that the whole idea of me taking the mickey out of that subject and those kind of women is funnier than anything in the world. Many Particularly people, when I'm just the opposite of that. Many people mightn't see the humour. The caption to this newspaper article last Sunday had in large print, the popular memory mm -hmm. is. So there you have the image being lodged again. Mm -hmm. And my editor in particular, to tell the truth, wasn't too pushed on this because mm -hmm. he hasn't pushed himself beyond that conception and no. I said, Niall, there's a hell of a lot more to this woman than, than th that's just a public persona. I would like for you to think that there is much more to me than... That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yes. And that's what I'm trying to get across to our readers. I yes. want to upend that image. Mm -hmm. I want to throw it out the window. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying, will it bother you then to think that some people, perhaps superficial or non-questioning, mm -hmm. will just say, oh, Eartha Kitt, yes, Shay's long, mm -hmm. sex. Yeah, bitch. Yeah, yeah, bitch, sharp yeah. tongue, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I can say it truly bothers me. Because it means that they're not interested in seeing anything else. And that's all they see. So to end it, to end it with this, uh, the, the popular memory being that people would remember you if you passed on, that that image would linger. But you came, was it, you came close to death in London and felt you had to write that to your daughter? Was that the story? No, I no, that was... With the bombings? No? When I wrote this, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that would be a truer reflection of how you would want to be remembered. Than this silly. I think so. Yeah, this lyric. Yes. Because so. that's the way I felt at that time. Like I said in the song, and when I introduced this, all by myself. You did you hear the recording from that part? I did. And therefore, uh, how do you want to? That's why I wrote it to my daughter. So that's I've written a song by Arthur May. Yeah, I've been up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, but everything's okay. I've been as honest as I could, and shame the shame of those who should, mm -hmm. who should be honest. Yes. Okay, the, the opening in your book and on the back of the album is My first scene in life, you wrote in Thurston's Child, was a long, dark, dusty road. I could not see the end of it. It just went down, down, down to end in what seemed like hell. Mm -hmm. To reverse that, what would you like to be your last scene? I think that's going to be it. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'm supposed to send them home happy. I <laughs> don't oh, come on. Do you? There is a light at the dark, at the end of the road. There is. There is a light at the end of the world. Eartha Kitt, who died 21 years after we did this interview. But to end, she told me that the image of herself as presented in that newspaper article most definitely is not how she'd want to be remembered. Instead, she said her epitaph, as she called it, is more so the lyric she wrote for the song, All By Myself. Sadly, I can't play my old bootleg cassette on the radio, so instead, let's end where we began with Thursday's Child. Thank you for listening and good night. Hi, Joe Jackson here again. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Joe Jackson Interviews podcast. More can be heard on my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com.